Good morning, church. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open it up to the Gospel of Matthew today. And I'd like you to join me in chapter 7 in verse 1. Matthew chapter 7 in verse 1. Well, we are in the midst here of a summer series where we're talking about urban legends of the Bible. And so far, as we've been thinking about some of the legends, we have looked at the legend that where two or three are gathered together, the God is there with them. And we have looked at the legend that says that women were created inferior to men. But this morning, we're going to look at a legend that I think, if you had ever thought about it, you might anticipate this might be a part of the series. It is a common assumption among people, and it's even, I would say, a common assumption among Christian people. And it's one that gets quoted quite often, maybe even more often than John 3.16 does anymore. And that passage is, do not judge lest you be judged. And of course, the implication of that is that, um, um, that Christian people are not to judge other people. Go ahead and advance the slide if you would one more. Well, we want to pause here this morning to consider whether or not this common sentiment is actually true. On the one hand, we see how this is actually very valuable advice. Being a judgmental person is not really very helpful, and it usually draws scorn in return. But on the other hand, is it realistic to assume that one can go throughout life without making judgments? I'm going to argue that one really can't do that, and I'm going to argue that it's especially true that Christian people can't do that. There are things that we do need to make judgments about, that we do need to make discernments about. Jesus says in John chapter 7 and verse 24, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. And so that seems to be the issue, judging correctly. And so perhaps it's not so much judging in general that we are condemning here, but learning how to make proper judgments. And Jesus is going to take up that particular subject in the Sermon on the Mount here this morning, and that is the primary passage that I want to look at with you. So I hope by now you do have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 7. If you do, I'd like to invite you to stand one more time in the honor of the reading of God's Word here this morning. And uh, after this reading, we'll share in a verse of a song. John, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is Jesus speaking here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred, Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The word of the Lord here this morning. Let's sing together. Take time to be holy. Be calm in thy soul. seated. 
Well, last week we were talking a little bit about the his, how the history of the world is a history of how women have been mistreated by men. As we begin here this morning, even though that is not going to be our general subject again here today, I do want to take you to a story where we see that very sort of thing happening. The story is told in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. You don't have to turn there. I'll just tell the story for you. Most people do not consider this story actually to be an original part of the Gospel of John. If you were reading along in the Gospel and you stopped at chapter 7 and verse 52 and then skipped over the first 11 verses of chapter 8 and began reading again in John chapter 8 and verse 12, the story of John's Gospel just kind of flows along seamlessly. And so the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John do not have this particular story. It seems like that it was added in sometime later. But even though most do not consider this story to be an original part of John's Gospel, there are very few scholars who actually deny that this might be an authentic story about the life of Jesus. On the one hand, it sounds like something that Jesus would do, And on the other hand, it does show up in enough older manuscripts in various other places besides here in John chapter 8 that there is a general feeling that, yes, indeed, this story really did happen as it is told. The story I'm talking about is the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. If you don't know that story... One day, Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was there for one of the festivals that was taking place. And as he would often do, Jesus would teach there in the temple court area for all the people. But these Pharisees, they they come to see Jesus there. They want to trap Jesus there. And they bring in this woman and they throw this woman before him who has been caught in the very act of a sexual transgression. It becomes very obvious early on that these religious leaders care nothing for this woman. They don't care whether she lives or dies, but they're just looking for a way to trap Jesus. They know Jesus to be a compassionate man. They know Jesus to be a man who often hangs out with sinful people. But they also know Jesus is a law-abiding man, that he holds himself to the strictest standards of the law. And so with that in mind, they think that they're going to catch Jesus in this conundrum. On the one hand, the law demands that when a person is caught in an act of adultery, they are to be stoned to death. This was a common principle of the law who were found guilty of people who were found guilty of moral sins. Now, if a person was just found guilty of a ritual sin, that is, they violated one of the rituals of the Old Testament, then they would be declared unclean and they would put, be put outside of the assembly for a while. But if someone was to be found to be in violation of one of the major moral laws of the Old Testament, there was only one penalty for that. Death, oftentimes death by stoning. And so here's this woman. She's been caught. It appears, at least on the surface, that she is guilty. And the religious leaders want to know how Rabbi Jesus is going to come down on this particular case. For those of you who do know the story, you know that Jesus begins to bend down and draw something or write something in the dirt. And no one knows what he's drawing there. No one knows what he's writing, but clearly he's stretching out the drama of this whole event. And after he's done, he pauses and he says to the religious leaders, let any of you who are without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he begins, he bends down and he begins to write in the dirt again. And one by one, they all walk away. And this woman is left standing alone with Jesus. Now, many of us are quite familiar with this, but I would suggest to you that despite our familiarity with the story, it is actually one of the most misunderstood actions of Jesus in all of the New Testament. 
Normally, when we see Jesus do this, we think that he is saying, if any one of you is without sin in your life, then you can be the first one to cast the stone at this woman. The implication clearly being, if any of you are pure enough to be without sin, you can be the one to condemn this woman. But let me put forward to you here this morning that if that were really the case, no one could make any judgment about anyone for anything. Because we are all sinners, which means no one could reprove or reprimand anyone. And some think, yeah, that's precisely the point Jesus is trying to make in this story. But I'm quite convinced that's not what Jesus is doing here. I think he's actually referring to something specific, something from the old law. In Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verses 15 through 21, the law talks about the nature of witnesses. And one thing that it says there is that no one is to be condemned based on the testimony of one witness alone, but there must be at least two or three witnesses for them to be found guilty. But another thing it says is that if someone is found to be a false witness, then the very sentence they're trying to pass upon someone else needs to then fall upon them. Notice a few things about this story with Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Where's the man in this story? Have you thought about that? If she was caught in the very act, where's he at? And number two, how did they catch her? How did they find her in the very act? And many thoughtful people have come to the conclusion that this woman was set up. She was set up as a trap for Jesus. And so maybe, just maybe, When Jesus bends down to write in the dirt, he was writing the words of this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 19. These men are false witnesses, corrupted witnesses. And so when Jesus says to them, if any of you are without sin, you be the first to throw the stone, he is not saying to them, you have no right to judge another person if you have sin in your life. He is saying to them, If any of you is free from the guilt of being a false witness in this situation, then you throw the first stone. They knew what he was implying. They knew the law. They knew they were faulty witnesses. And so one by one, they walked away. And I think that story illustrates very well the principle that is at work in our urban legend here this morning. Jesus says two things in the New Testament, and on the surface, they seem to contradict one another. On the one hand, he says in our text here this morning, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. But on the other hand, we've already seen that he says in John chapter 7 and verse 24, judge correctly. So how are we to understand these things? How are we to hold these two things together? Well, I'm going to suggest to you here this morning that when we read through these opening verses of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives us the appropriate balance for holding these things together. And he's going to do so with three sayings, three parts. He's going to give a warning and then a ridicule And then finally, a rule. And I want to handle each one of those briefly here this morning, one at a time. First, the warning. Look at verse 1 again of chapter 7. Do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure that you use it, it will be measured to you. Now, I think most of us are pretty familiar with this statement. We understand the warning that is being given. But I would actually argue there are two senses in which this particular warning is true. 
The first sense is just kind of a plain practical matter. If you make it a habit of judging other people, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> they are going to judge you in return. If you make it a habit of pointing things out in other people's life that are not right, pretty soon they're going to need to feel the need to retaliate and they're going to look for some sin in your life. And guess what? They're going to find something. None of us are without sin. None of us are without weak spots in our character. And so when people perceive a judgmental attitude on your part, they're not going to you know, just take that happily. They're going to turn around and say to you, what right do you have to judge me when you have these things that are wrong in your life? And of course, they're correct about that. Now, there's truth to this. But I would suggest that if we misunderstand this truth and misapply this truth, it could lead us to a kind of paralysis. This does not mean that Christians are not to use discernment and to make judgments whatsoever. For example, think about our first week in our study here of the urban legends of the Bible. That first week we talked about the text where it says where two or three are gathered together, God is there in their midst. And we learned from studying the context of that passage that that's not about small groups of prayer and worship, but it's about when small groups have to come together and make the very difficult decision to discipline a brother or sister in Christ or even to disfellowship one of the members of the church. And so how could members of the church make that kind of decision if they did not bring some kind of judgment upon their brother or sister who has fallen into sin? How could in discipline be enacted by the church if they do not make some kind of value judgment? Clearly, there is a form of judgment to be made there, and Christ is the very one who is teaching us we have to make those kind of judgments. So as we recognize that when we judge, we will be judged in return, we're not saying that judgments are never to be made. But we are saying, as we'll say repeatedly this morning, it has to do with that inner attitude of the heart. If a person is simply looking to condemn others, they are going to be condemned in return. No one likes a judgmental person. But that does not mean that all judgment is ruled out. What is ruled out is that which comes from pride rather than the humility of heart which is looking out for the best for someone else. But speaking of pride, this leads to the second aspect of what this could mean. Not only will other people judge you if you come to them in a judgmental spirit, but the text, I think, is teaching that God himself will judge you with the same measure you use to judge other people. You see, one of our fatal flaws as religious people is that we tend to grow proud in our morality. We begin to think we're a little bit superior and we easily forget that if we have been saved and if, if by God's grace we have been able to increase in our holiness and morality, that is because it is a gift of God's grace. Now we have our part to play in it to be for sure, but, but the dominant factor is always God's going before us and God giving us his gracious gift of help. Many of us live moral lives, have been taught by good moral parents, and we might assume we've kind of hit a home run in life in terms of morality. But the fact is, many of us were just kind of born on third base. Isn't that true? Not everyone has this advantage. Not everyone begins at the same position. And so if you assume a judgmental attitude toward others who have come out of much more difficult circumstances than you have, how much lack of gratitude does that show for the way that God has been merciful in your life. And so, if you're going to take a prideful position towards others, if you're going to look down your nose at them because your morality is better than theirs, God is going to judge you by your own standard. But when put to that kind of test, 
Who can claim anything? Who has any merit before God? As I've stated many times before, no doubt will, many times going forward in the future, there is no room for pride in the kingdom of God. All who are in the kingdom are there because of grace and mercy, not because they're worthy in any way. And even those who do make great advances in godliness, they do so because the sovereign hand of God is guiding them. So this warning needs to be taken to heart. If you are going to judge others harshly, be prepared that God is going to use your own standard against you. Once you understand that first point, the second one then comes very naturally. If the first point is a warning, the second point is what we would call a ridicule. And you'll see what I mean, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Perhaps you can see why I have labeled this particular point a ridicule. The observation that Jesus makes here borderlines on the absurd. It's almost like one of those old-fashioned cartoons, you know, where we have this guy who has a little speck of sawdust in his eye, and, and yet you've got another guy with a two-by-four, and he's trying to help him out. I mean, it's a ridiculous picture, isn't it? So what's the point of this absurd picture? The point, once again, has to do with our attitude. I don't know if this is true about you, but I'm guessing it is because it's true about me as well. We naturally enlarge the sin of other people and minimize and excuse the sin in our own life. Oh, we're willing to have all kinds of grace and mercy towards ourselves because we know, bless our hearts, we're trying our best in this whole thing. But then we're unwilling to to overlook even the slightest wrong in another person. And the comparison doesn't have to be about the size of the sin. It doesn't have to be about the, the, um, uh, the, the severity of the sin. It has to do with that inner attitude of the heart that is so ready to judge other people while overlooking our own failures. Now, I will warn you that we can make the same mistake here as with Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Remember, I pointed out that sometimes we read Jesus in that story as saying if no one can cast a stone unless they are free of sin in their life. But that's not what Jesus is saying. I'm convinced of that. If he was saying that, none of us could ever reprove anyone in each other's life. The problem is with the heart. The religious leaders were complicit with what was happening. They were setting her up so that they could set Jesus up. And the same problem can occur here when we think about Jesus teaching about the speck and the plank. We may think we cannot help someone with their sin, reprove someone of their sin, until all the sin has been removed from our life. But that can't be the case because it never will be the case. We all have sin all of the time. No, the plank once again goes back to the attitude of the heart, the willingness to overlook all of our own sin, but to focus very intently on the smallest problems in the life of others. That's what needs to be reproved. That's what needs to be dealt with. But all of that then leads to the third and final point of the text, a point that I'm calling a rule. And this rule is from verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If it's not apparent by now that the Christian life does involve various kinds of judgment, then this last point ought to remove all doubt for us. Christ is obviously calling us to make a distinction here. And what is the distinction? We are to judge between those who are open and willing to hear our reproof and those who are not. 
This is not the only place, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount where such distinctions are made. If your Bible's still open there to Matthew chapter 7, you can look a little bit further down in that text, and you can see another place where Jesus asks us to make similar distinctions. In verse 15, Jesus tells us to watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing because inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And he says to them, by your fruit you will know them. Perhaps you've heard it said before, the Christians are not judgmental people, but they are good fruit inspectors, right? And I think that is exactly the point. Clearly, we are sometimes to make judgments about others. We have to discern whether or not they're false teachers. We have to discern whether the fruit of godliness is in their life and they're true believers in Christ, And in a similar way, in our text this morning, Jesus is saying you have to make discernments about who you give your judgments to. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't a time when we have to preach the gospel, even when we know they may not be ready for it. Churches have an obligation to preach the gospel to all people. Parents have an obligation to share the truth with their children, even if they're not quite prepared for it. And at times, we may need to confront our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ, even if they're not ready to receive it. Sometimes things just have to be said. But generally speaking... Jesus is telling us, be wise in how you approach other people. As he notes in other places, you have to be as innocent as doves, but also as shrewd as serpents. It does no good to always be banging on people when they don't have a heart to hear what you're saying. It it does no good to force our little pearls of wisdom on people when they're not asking for it. As a matter of fact, it pushes them further away. And so in the same way, Jesus is calling us to be wise and discerning, to make appropriate judgments in how we approach others, both in reproving them and in preaching the gospel. Look for opportunities of openness. Don't force it upon other people who are not ready. And most of all, as he'll say in the next few verses, ask, seek, knock, ask God to create that opening in their life. So as we close here this morning, let me just draw a couple quick points of application. Really, I'm only restating what we've already learned here this morning, but perhaps it's worth doing so in a way that draws it all together. First, we must understand that while we are not to have a general attitude of being judgmental, We can fall into the opposite trap where we make no judgments or moral discernments at all until we are completely free from sin in our own life. And I just want to say to you this morning, that will never happen this side of heaven. And so Jesus cannot mean here you are to judge nothing until you are sin free. That's not what he was telling the Pharisees in the story, nor is it what he is telling us here in Matthew chapter 7. But having said that, the second point of application is to note that we always should be much harsher on our own sin than we are on the sin of other people. We should always, I think, assume the worst about our own motives and assume the best about the motives of other people rather than the other way around, which is the way that we often do it. Now, I don't mean by that you ought to be constantly down on yourself. Sometimes we can beat ourselves up too much in that way too. But I just mean if you're going to be critical, be critical about yourself rather than being your first impulse to be critical of others. And then finally this morning, use your judgment and discernment in regard to how you approach other people in their life. Not everyone's ready for the gospel yet. Not everyone's ready to to hear about the things that are going on in their life that need to be changed. And sometimes you may need to be bold and say something even when they're not ready. But most of the time, I'm convinced, you use your judgment. You use your wisdom. Good judgment will help us know when that ground is fertile. Some things to think about here this morning. Let's pray together. 
Father, these subjects can be confusing at times. On the one hand, you tell us not to judge, but on the other hand, in other places, you tell us that we must make good and appropriate judgments. And so one of the tasks of our study of your son is to figure out, okay, what does he mean? How are we to apply our judgments? I'm quite convinced that in most cases, we're to keep our little pearls of wisdom to ourselves. But there may come moments when we need to make wise discernments in terms of others and even reprove others because of unrepented sin in their life. I don't always know how to go about that. I've always fumbled around with it in my own life. But Father, I pray that you would help us to, to be wise in our approach with one another. First of all, let us love one another deeply. Always be looking out for the best for one another. But then, Father, if there ever comes moments when we have to do the difficult thing, that you would give us a gracious and willing spirit to do that. So, Father, we're always learning. We're always um, weighing things out. We're always figuring things out. And so I pray that you would give us wisdom in regard to this particular subject so that we may know how to serve you best. This is our prayer today, in the name of Christ, amen.